Welcome back, Dean Obidala's show. Right now, very happy to welcome on the show live with us our friend Glenn Kirshner, former 30-year federal prosecutor, served in the U.S. Army JAG Corps. We see him as a legal analyst on MSNBC all the time. All, also has his own podcast, Justice Matters with Glenn Kirshner, YouTube channel. He's got everything going on. Glenn, good to see you. Dean, good to see you, my friend. I told Glenn in the commercial, and he had not seen this yet, and he is angry, and I am angrier. So it is buried even on CNN. I have not found it on foxnews.com. Here it is, report of investigation, security failures at the United States Capitol on January 6th, prepared at the direction of Congressman Jim Banks, Rodney Davis, Jim Jordan, Kelly Armstrong, and Troy Nell. It's like a 100-page report. Leadership and law enforcement failures within the U.S. Capitol left the complex vulnerable on January 6th. They don't fault Donald Trump at all in their executive conclusions. And the only tweet they include of Donald Trump's on January 6th is the one where he said, respect police, not the one right before that, when he said, Mike Pence failed us, you know, and he's letting America down. This is a whole new gaslighting. This is off the charts. So I know you haven't read it, but I promise you I'm representing the truthful. Everything I've said is right from the report so far. Yeah, you know, yeah. Jim Jordan is like uh, is like Donald Trump's defense attorney. It really doesn't matter how implausible, how frivolous, how laughable the defense is. Jim Jordan is going to make that defense. Um, so it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't even anger me all that much. I think it's a further sign that the Republican Party, as presently constituted, is circling the drain and is going to get sucked down into the sewer. Um, and, you know, we're probably going to have something rise up from the ashes of the current Republican Party. I could see um, what rises up being led by a Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger or others who actually give a crap about the health and viability of our democracy, because it's pretty clear that Jim Jordans of the world don't care about anything except currying favor with a career criminal, Donald Trump. What they have done, it's like writing a report about 9-11 and not blaming Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, like blaming everyone, blaming the building for being in the way, blaming the airport security. Now, you can do an after-the-fact investigation, but still, you would say there was a terrorist attack that was delivered on the United States of America by Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, and then from that, now we're reviewing how to prevent a future attack. This, they literally blame Nancy Pelosi in something that's been debunked, that Speaker Pelosi did not have control of the police or the National Guard on January 6th. The report itself is lies. I, I, I should be like you. I shouldn't be angry about it. It's a BS report. It's only five members of the entire 200 plus GOP members of the House caucus that would put their name on it. That's how garbage it is. Yeah. You know, and Jim Jordan, by ignoring the incriminating text messages that Donald Trump posted that day, you know, there are actually three ways you can commit the crime of insurrection. Um, any one of the three would satisfy to find somebody guilty. You can incite an insurrection. Check. Donald Trump did that with his speech prior to you know, his, his pep rally for the insurrectionists. Go to the Capitol. Fight like hell or you won't have a country anymore. Now stop the certification. He incited it. You can assist in the insurrection. What did he do after Mike Pence decided to actually abide by the law instead of corruptly throw the election to Donald Trump? He assisted in the attack that was already underway at the Capitol. And he said, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what was right. What did that do? It further enraged the people who were already enraged as a result of the pre-insurrection pep rally, and it inspired chance of hang Mike Pence. Check, that's the second way. He committed the crime. He violated the federal statute of insurrection or rebellion. And the third way is you can give aid and comfort to the insurrection or the insurrectionists. And that's precisely what Donald Trump did when he said, we love you. This is what happens when a, an election is viciously stolen from you. Go home and always remember this day. He hit the trifecta of insurrection. He violated the statute in all three ways. So the fact that Jim Jordan 
sort of, you know, offers none of that in his report, tells you everything you need to know about Jim Jordan's goals and objectives. And also, you, you can tell this report's not a big deal because they did not hype it in advance and they're dropping it on December 23rd, 21st, right before Zelensky's going to speak before Congress. And that's all the headlines for tomorrow. And they know that. I think they might even be embarrassed by this. We'll see. We'll see what happens. D, so, D, can I ahead. tell you what this report, What I, have, I haven't read the report, but taking your word for it, you, you know what this report is? It is Jim Jordan serving as an accessory after the fact to Donald Trump's crimes. It's Jim Jordan giving aid and comfort to the insurrection. I hope DOJ pays attention to that. Well, I was going to ask you later, but let's go right now. Do you look at members of Congress? Are there any Republican members of Congress objectively that should be facing criminal charges for their role in either the attempted coup or the actual attack on January 6th? Well, the ones who requested pardons, certainly, I think there were six of them. They knew that they committed crime crimes, which is why they requested pardons. They wanted to get away with the crimes that they knew they were committing. So their request of a pardon is an admission of guilt. So they should absolutely be looked at for potential criminal charges. And I believe Jack Smith and his team will do that. We also know that there were members of Congress who defied congressional subpoenas. We can talk about that as we kind of move into the J6 report. But Those people should also be prosecuted in my estimation. And I don't want to jump ahead because I I definitely have a few choice words for the decision of the J6 committee to not refer those people for prosecution. Um, But they are also culpably involved in the insurrection. Why? Because they defied congressional subpoenas. They refused to testify about information they had about Donald Trump's involvement in the insurrection, they decided to cover it up and not just cover it up. They decided to cover it up by committing their own crime of contempt of Congress in their determination to keep under wraps the evidence Mm -hmm. that they had about Donald Trump's culpability. I'm chatting with former prosecutor Glenn Kirshner. So, Glenn, when you look at the four charges, though, referred to DOJ, Can you explain to people, you know, you're a former federal prosecutor in DOJ. What really happens now? What does the Department of Justice do when Congress refers to them potential prosecutions of people? So um, the Department of Justice will politely say, thank you very much for your recommendations. And they will be entirely dismissive of those recommendations because DOJ will make an independent prosecutorial determination. They're not going to be governed by a congressional suggestion about who should be prosecuted or for what crime. What they will accept, and I think they will accept it with some enthusiasm, is the thousand plus transcripts of the witnesses who testified to the J6 committee, because it's probably a treasure trove of incriminating information. Now, I hesitate to say this, Dean, but when you give prosecutors a thousand transcripts, that's going to slow things down. It may bog things down a little bit. And I think you and I are probably in agreement that DOJ couldn't possibly move any slower on charges for the command structure of the insurrection, the suits of the insurrection, not just the boots of the insurrection. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is still an important next investigative step for DOJ to get all of that evidence that has been developed in what was really a superb, exhaustive investigation conducted by the J6 committee, and DOJ will build on it. What I predict they'll do is they'll go through the transcripts, they'll figure out what witnesses are most relevant to the ongoing criminal investigation in the grand jury, they'll bring those witnesses in, they'll review the transcripts, they'll make sure they're accurate and complete, they'll give the witness the opportunity to make any additions or corrections, mm. then they will put that witness in the grand jury. And here's one of the, uh, the, the fringe benefits of having a transcript that is handed to a prosecutor. When we walk into the grand jury with a witness and there's a pre-existing transcript, what we do is we say, um, are you willing to adopt the substance of this transcript as your testimony today before the grand jury. Do you wanna make any corrections or additions? Now, 
let me ask you the half a dozen or dozen follow-up questions that I need to ask you to develop some additional information and evidence, and then you're on your way. So it actually could have the effect of, um, of condensing the work in some respects that the prosecutors will have to do with each witness. So this is going to proceed along its course there. Is there any, I know this is a tough question, but a reasonable time frame that you think special counsel would wrap up these investigate? It's two different investigations. Like what is a year reasonable? Is six months reasonable? I mean, I'm not trying to pressure the guy. He just got appointed. It's not his fault he was appointed just a month ago. He should have been appointed a year and a half ago. He's going to do the best job he can. What's reasonable at this point? Yeah, my crystal ball's in the shop, Dean. Um, and and mm-hmm. if, if I make a prediction, it's likely to be wrong. But um, I think the, the Department of Justice has been investigating the crimes of Trump and his criminal associates for you know well over a year now. So you know, Jack Smith stepped into an ongoing investigation. It could be that he is preparing to drop some indictments against at least some of the players in the next couple of months. It could be that he is going to wait and drop a big old conspiracy indictment that includes all of the players in one overarching mega conspiracy. If that's the case, I wouldn't expect to see it for another six months, eight months, 10 months. Um, But it's impossible to predict because we don't know how he's going to proceed. Here's my hope. My -hmm. hope is that he indicts some damn body who is in the command structure, who is a person of privilege and influence and power and wealth, because as of yet, not a single one of them have been touched by accountability. Only the schlubs, and there's a bunch of schlubs, and there's some really dangerous and nefarious actors too, like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys and others who attack the Capitol. And then there's a bunch of dupes who you know, weren't critical thinkers enough to realize that they'd been lied to about their election being stolen. And they were listening to Donald Trump and they went up and they attacked the Capitol. These people are being held accountable every day, but not a single suit of the insurrection has been hold, held accountable. And I hope to heck that Jack Smith understands the need to send a message that we are working our way up. We will be holding the, the suits, the, pe- the people of power and privilege and influence accountable criminally, just like we're holding the boots of the insurrection accountable criminally. I would like a Christmas indictment. That would be very nice. It now it's like Christmas Eve or something. It's not going to happen. So, Glenn, you touched on this earlier that the committee did a great job in referring to crimes, but I sense some frustration about certain members of Congress that they actually identified by name, including Kevin McCarthy, Jim Jordan who blew off their subpoenas and they've only reco- suggested them or referred them for ethics committee investigations. What do you think the committee should have done? Yeah, I have a deep disagreement with that decision. And, uh, and mm-hmm. if we get to the referrals that they did make, I think it's worth touching on um, the fact that they basically referred Donald Trump and others for witness tampering more precisely for conspiracy to make a false statement. But let let me first take on my disagreement with the J6 committee's decision. There were, uh, I I think, five members of Congress who defied congressional subpoenas, Kevin McCarthy, Jim Jordan, Scott Perry, Andy Biggs, and Mo Brooks. They committed, Dean, the precise same crime that Mark Meadows committed and Dan Scavino committed. Those two men were referred for criminal prosecution by Congress and that Steve Bannon and Peter Navarro committed, those two men were, redite, it were it referred for uh, criminal indictment and prosecution by Congress. Of course, DOJ decided to indict two and declined to indict yeah. two. But what I have a real beef with is when members of Congress, their fellow lawmakers, members of the same little club, committed the identical crime, the J6 committee flinched and they said, we're not going to refer them for prosecution. I think that sends the wrong message that they are members of a privileged club. And, you know, it, it, I think, was the weak spot in the J6 committee's decisions about who to refer for criminal prosecution. Because how do we feel about them being referred to the House Ethics Committee 
how do we feel about organizations that police themselves? Look at how well that's working out up at the Supreme Court, right? How is yep. Chief Justice Roberts policing Clarence Thomas's and, and Sammy the Bull Alito's misconduct? <laughs> Not particularly right. well, right. right? So this is a beef I have. But overall, I don't want it to, to detract from the remarkable work the J6 committee has done. I just have a serious quibble with that one decision. When you look at the four crimes that the J6 committee referred that were articulated at the hearing by Congressman Raskin, were you any of those su surprising? I mean, two of them were in the motion that we talked about nonstop, Judge Carter, a long time ago. Then you had the two others, the 1001, Section 1001 violation, and then insurrection. So were you surprised by any of them? And what's your reaction? Yeah, the sleeper referral, I think, was the witness tampering. They referred Donald Trump for being part of a conspiracy, which is really important, part of a conspiracy to make false statements. And what we have since learned by some CNN reporting today is yep. that, and you can't make this up, Dean, Donald Trump's White House ethics lawyer tampered with a witness, Cassidy Hutchinson, who he was representing as a client at the time and told her not to testify truthfully to the J6 committee. And because it's a conspiracy charge that they referred, what does that tell you? It tells you that Donald Trump and his nefarious lawyer, whose name is Stefan, you'll have to remind Pasantano. me of his last name. Pas Pasantino. Pas Pas Pasantino, Stefan Pasantino, remember that name because he's about to go on the inside. He's about to go through some things. These two men, at a minimum, um, conspired. They entered into an agreement to tamper with the testimony of Cassidy Hutchinson. Dean, that is such an important charge for three reasons. One, it carries with it a separate prison term, apart from the other charges that mm -hmm. I believe Donald Trump will be indicted for. Two, it's a prosecutor's nightmare when witnesses are tampered with, but in another way, it is prosecutorial and evidentiary gold. You know, court after court after court through the, the decades, through the centuries, they've all said similar things. They've said that witness tampering is it, it strikes right at the heart of the integrity of the criminal justice system. It is a cancer. And what 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 prosecutors get to do when somebody has tampered with a witness is argue that the fact that they tampered with the witness is consciousness of guilt evidence for every other crime we have indicted them on or we have alleged they committed. Why? Because you don't need to tell a witness to lie if the witness's truthful testimony doesn't hurt you, doesn't incriminate you. Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony did incriminate Trump, so he entered into a conspiracy to tamper with her truthful testimony. That is powerful, powerful evidence of consciousness of guilt of all of the other crimes. And here's the third reason it's really important. Anytime you have a conspiracy, you have an opportunity to flip somebody. So you can bet Stefan is probably not going to want to spend the rest of his life in prison. So I would look for him to strike a deal, flip on his co-conspirator, Donald Trump, and let's put him in the prosecutor's stable of cooperating witnesses. And that lawyer, Stefan, has taken a leave of absence from the firm that he was working at. And, you know, I knew that even before the media reported it today. Last night when I Googled him, it went to this law firm, Michael Best or something, and you went to his page and it was gone. So this page has been removed. I'm like, wow, they removed him like that because this is as bad as you can get. I think he was a partner in the firm that he was telling a client to lie to congressional committee. This guy, he committed a crime in his own right, and it destroys the credibility of this law firm if he remains as a partner in it. How are you going to have a partner who's going to tell people, oh, you're from the law firm where they tell you to lie to Congress type of thing that, that can come up all the time. So, so he's and, committing and the Trump, Trump's right. pack, Trump's pack, Trump's pack was pay. paying for that lawyer. So he could try to unlawfully convince his client to lie and not incriminate Donald Trump. I mean, that is as horrendous but, as legal representation gets. But we know Donald Trump is a mob boss and there are buffers like in the Godfather. 
that he, Michael Cohen has testified to this and even said it on my show and other shows that Donald Trump doesn't say, go tell Cassie Hutchinson to lie. He subtly infers things and people pick it up. What would you need if you're going to be prosecuting Donald Trump for being involved in this conspiracy to be able to prove like that he was involved in the conspiracy to tamper with his witness? Dean, there's so much evidence. For 30 years, I did nothing but prosecute cases in court. I was never looking to climb the bureaucratic ladder of success at the Department of Justice. Maybe I was incapable of climbing that ladder, but I knew what I loved to do. Right. And it was go into court every day and try cases, often with my junior prosecutors that I supervised. Um, I rarely had the kind of evidence of guilt that has been amassed against Donald Trump. I mean, just there's one marquee statement that I think sums up Donald Trump's criminal intent. It's when his own DOJ officials were telling him there's no fraud undermining the election. And he said, I don't care. Just say there was and leave the rest to me and my Republican allies in Congress. Dean, every other piece of evidence will flow through that statement and will prove crime after crime after crime after crime. I get so crazy when people say it's so hard to, to prove criminal intent. No, it's not. I did it for 30 years without half the evidence we have against Donald Trump. We successfully prosecute mob bosses who insulate themselves precisely the way Donald Trump does. And we don't run around saying it's so hard. It's so hard. We just do it because they're not right. former presidents. Well, now we need to take on a former president. We need you back. Like Tom Brady retired for a year and then came back. We need you back with a suit on back trying this case. You in prosecuting Trump. Last thing in our, in our last minute, anything from the Trump tax returns jump out at you that we haven't had the full returns yet, but we had the report. Yeah. You know what jumps out at me? Steve Mnuchin is a criminal, right? And it, it, remember Bill Pascrell from New Jersey mm -hmm. called him, him a criminal. Yeah, said you violated buddy, yeah. The law. yeah. I know, you know, Bill, right. And he was right. He was dead on when he was questioning Mnuchin. He said, you broke the law, you violated the law. And he did. How much longer Dean do the American people have to suffer the, the, the Steve Mnuchin's of the world acting as a, criminal uh, protector of Donald Trump, which we know he did, how long before we actually begin to restore ethics in government and bring credibility for the crimes of, for example, the Steve Mnuchin's of the world who prevented what was a required audit of Donald Trump's taxes. And then he hid, he unlawfully hid the tax returns from Congress and by extension from the American people. How long do we have to suffer this? I could not agree with you more. And I love Bill Pascarell because he's a feisty Jersey Italian guy. I've had him on the show countless times. He's a lot of fun to chat with. Glenn, thank you, my friend. I just want to say thank you since we're at the end of the year here. Thanks for all the time you've been on the show and you share your insight. You make me smarter. You make the listeners smarter. I truly appreciate it. Merry Christmas to you and your family and Happy New Year. I look forward to chatting with you in the new year. Have a great holiday, Dean. You too, my friend. Take care.